Here we are. All right. Um, thank you so much for your patience. Um, so again, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ariana Lopez. I am the Assistant Director of Global Learning and Leadership. Um, and my program that I oversee is the Alternative Broke Break Program, excuse me. Um, and that is housed within the Center for Community Engagement and Service. So um, maybe by, let's see if I can see people here. Okay, I'm still, uh, still trying to share my screen here. Okay, can everybody see my screen now? Yes. Okay, perfect, thank you. All right. Um, Okay, so um, so the Center for Community Engagement and Service, what are we about? Um, hopefully some of you have heard of our office before, but the Center for Community Engagement and Service is housed on the second floor of the Mary Graydon Center. Our office is essentially the hub for students to connect with the DC community and beyond. So we provide lots of service experiences. Um, some are academic credit bearing. Um, some of them are more um, extracurricular, co-curricular like the Alternative Break Program. But we're also gonna talk about how we can make programs like the Alternative Break Program have a little bit more um, weight within the academic department and also talk about how you could perhaps support students in um, obtaining a independent credit for their hard work that they do at the Alternative Break Program. All that to say is that the Center for Community Engagement and Service does a lot of great work to connect students to nonprofit organizations, um, to provide professional development opportunities. And so the Alternative Break Program is just one of those programs that is housed within the Center for Community Engagement and Service, or as we are called here on the AU campus, CSES. So, so that's CCES for CSES, in case you've heard that floating around on campus. Um, all right, so the agenda for today is we're going to talk a little bit about what is the Alternative Break Program. It is both a philosophy and a pedagogy. So you know, we are very intentional in scaffolding a curriculum that truly prepares students to engage with communities that are most of the time unfamiliar to them, right? And in order to build intercultural competencies, um, gain the skills that they can build ethical and sustainable relationships. So it is a pedagogy. We have a curriculum that we follow. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And it's also a philosophy, right? We're also about pushing students beyond their comfort zone, humble and modest living, ethical engagement with communities, preserving human dignity and amplifying voices that are not typically heard on the global stage. And why are you here, right? So how can faculty or staff get involved? So we do have a few different um, roles that you can fulfill. Um, and as I mentioned before, you know, if you're interested in perhaps uh, being a faculty advisor for a student who's looking to pursue an independent credit for the work that they're doing for this program. Um, we'd love to, you know, speak with you. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what's involved, you know, the commitment level. Eligibility. So there are certain uh, positions within our program that are only eligible for full-time faculty and staff exempt. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and for those of you who are just interested in maybe collaborating with our office on a program that you're envisioning for your classroom, maybe for your student cohort, um, you know, I will we'll talk about how we can create some space to, to engage. And then I do have a former program advisor. Her name is Professor Rhonda Zimlich. She is the program advisor. Uh, last spring, she accompanied our group to Austin, Texas on a program called um, Sexual and Reproductive Health Rights and Justice. Uh, phenomenal student leaders that we had um, and Professor Zimlich, Rhonda was um, an absolute asset to that program. So she'll tell you a little bit about what to expect if you are interested in accompanying a group uh, on a trip, which you can imagine traveling with a group of students is a commitment, right? And so she'll tell you a little bit about you know, how to do that. 
Then we'll talk about the goals for 2023, 2024. So um, as you may or may not have heard, Alternative Breaks has undergone a bit of restructuring. We have revitalized our program post pandemic to really consider some of the systemic uh, challenges that we're facing, not only as a program, but as an institution and as a globe, right, as a world, um, and thinking about how to make our programs more sustainable, more accessible, more affordable. Um, and so we are looking at kind of um, reframing some of our programming due to some of those concerns that we have been considering. And of course, I will leave some time for you all um, for some Q&A. Um, but really quick, I know we've got probably about 13 of you in the virtual room right now. Um, I'm going to start a bit of chaos here. And if you can just drop in the chat, my first question to you, well, actually, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves um, by chat. And I'm just going to kind of quickly uh, gloss through the responses here. But I'd love to hear kind of who's in the room. Um, so if you can let me know by chat your name, your preferred pro pronouns, if you'd like, um, your title, your department, and whether or not you've had any experience with Alternative Breaks program. So again, name, pronoun, title, department, experience with Alt Break. And I've just dropped that in the chat and I'll just take a few moments here to let the responses roll in. Hey, Jessica, thanks for being here. Hey, Cara, Caroline, Carmen, nice to see you all. So we got SIS, Study Abroad Advisor, no students. Wonderful. Great, so some of you came here maybe by way of reference from a student, right? Maybe a student said, hey, there's this really awesome program. We'd love for you to be connected. Celeste, nice to see you. Oh, Rhonda, you're already here. Wonderful. Thanks for being here. Jason, Amanda. Michelle, nice to see you. Great to see some familiar faces. Jesse, thank you for being here. All right. Thank you so much. And if you haven't had a chance to respond, I see Simon, Marcy. Great, so we have lots of different departments, right? We have some faculty, we have um, some staff, we have those who have experience and those who don't. So that's okay, you know, as I mentioned, Alternative Breaks has gone through a lot of changes. Um, and so for those of you who have even been a part of the program before, some of this might be new to you, right? We've created new roles using new language, right? We know at, in the, academia in the world that language is very important. So we've also shifted some of our language to make sure that we're really aligning our program with the values. Wonderful. So thank you so much, everybody, for sharing who you are. It's always good to know who's in the room. All right. So what is the Alternative Break Program? Um, well, first, let me tell you, well, let me have a student tell you from their perspective. Um, we had a, a number of groups uh, launched last year. We had a number of programs. And so one such program that we had was a group that went to Cape Town, South Africa in winter of last year. Uh, the title of their program was Combating Xenophobia, the Impact of Resettlement. And so what this group um, really love to explore was, you know, in a post-apartheid uh, society, what do, what does society look like, right? What does civil society look like in terms of those who have maybe been resettled due to racist um, policies during apartheid? And what do policies look like now that we have large, um, large masses of migrants who are moving to South Africa? So, we have a student who uh, created a blog, and so I'll go ahead and let you hear directly from her about her experience. Oh, and it would be helpful if the video showed. Oh, there it is. 
let's try again. Hi. Wait for me here. Let's try this again. Hi, my name is Hope, and I was a participant on the Winter 2023 Alternative Break to Cape Town, South Africa. Find out more in this video about my adventure. We went to Cape Town to seek more understanding about xenophobia and migrant issues in South Africa, which has an interesting relationship with the social issue, especially due to apartheid in very recent history. To do this, we engaged with a variety of community partners, including a lawyer who was a migrant himself that was part of the Refugee Legal and Advocacy Center, a minister part of the Church Unity Commission, our tour guides at Robben Island, the personnel of the Refugee Rights Unit of the University of Cape Town's law faculty, and the various other people we were privileged to interact with while in the country. Personally, I wasn't as aware as I should have been about issues within Africa, other than the standard case studies I had learned about in classes as a public health student. It was only through this trip that I realized that issues like xenophobia play out in various ways, depending on where you find yourself experiencing and or learning about it. Overall, my impressions during the trip were mixed between senses of awe and sadness and understanding the rhetoric of xenophobia from differing perspectives, a sense of respect for those who have been directly affected by the social factors involved in South Africa's current collective state, and also because they were willing to talk about their experiences, and a sense of comfort in being in a place that reminded me so much of places I call home. All right, so that was Hope Alex. Oops, I just started again. Um, talking a little bit about her experience, and as you can see, you know, some of the things she highlighted was that sense of community that she found, not just with her her cohort, right, right, but also the host community. Um, and you know, the Mannenberg School project really is quite a fascinating project that the students worked on. Um, they have actually established, now the Mannenberg School, just for a bit of context, the Mannenberg School is a school, or rather um, a school that serves a community called Mannenberg. And they uh, were a population of black South Africans that were forcibly removed during apartheid from central Cape Town to the shanty towns on the outskirts. Um, and so this school, you know, supported those families um, and our students really bonded with them. They're really excited to connect with these students and since then have created a pen pal program that will also serve to be sort of a fund fundraising mentorship program to help uh, um, support that school. So what we really look to uh, focus and emphasize in our programming is sustainable impact, right? We say that the trip, right, the immersion portion is not the program, right? That's just one part of it and that the learning that they experience and the action and the activism continues after the culmination of that trip. All right, so let me um, figure myself out with the technology here again. All right. And if there are any questions at any point, I just want to mention now, you know, I welcome you to drop those questions in the chat. Um, I will try to respond to those at the end, but by all means, if you just need to remember your questions, uh, feel free to drop that in the chat there. All right. 
So alternative breaks, believe it or not, that program that you saw that Hope went on was organized by students. So what makes alternative breaks so special and so unique is that it is student driven. This year, we will have a leadership council, which um, you know, will be our, our primary decision-making body who will determine the programs that we will offer for the academic year. Full transparency, typically, we would have already announced the programs by the start of the fall, um, but with the restructuring, we are a bit behind schedule. So at this current time, I am assembling the leadership council. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, um, but we will be announcing the programs uh, sometime probably in early October is my goal. Um, so it's really students who decide what programs we're going to offer. Um, and then through this leadership council, this new inaugural leadership council for this year, they will design, develop, and implement these programs. Uh, we provide as an office just guidance, leadership, coaching, mentorship, but I have to say it's truly our phenomenal students that make these programs happen. They partner with faculty and staff members such as yourself who can provide guidance as far as, you know, community issues, intercultural competency, um, competencies, skills, things like that. Um, but it's really our students who make it all happen. Um, and again, there, we are not a standalone program. So some of you who maybe have gone to other universities, visited other institutions, um, might have seen alternative breaks at other universities. So it is a nationwide program. There are, I believe, something like 35 chapters of alternative break programs around the country. And for that, we have to um, meet certain principles. So Breakaway is our national umbrella organization. They provide sort of best practices uh, around implementing and designing these programs. And so these are the components that they have identified as being the most critical for alternative break programs. The first being strong engagement. And I wanna point out that this actually changed in the last year where in the, the past it was strong direct service. But as a, as um, an organization, as a practice, you know, what we have realized is that direct service is not always the best thing, right? Especially when we are having students going to far off locations, perhaps to locations where they don't speak the language um, and they're only there for such a short amount of time. We understand that direct service might actually not be the best way to cultivate that impact. So for that, we've kind of changed the language to say engagement. That means it could be direct service. It could be indirect service, right? It could be research, advocacy, other types of engagement. Um, we also have shifted our focus to do more uh, learning base, experiential learning base. So a lot of our students this past year will tell you that they maybe didn't do a whole lot of service, but what they did do was a lot of really enlightening conversations, right? They, they engaged in a lot of dialogue with the community partners um, and they reflected on that, on what they learn. And as I mentioned, our program is about applying what they learned overseas or in their location, perhaps domestic, here in their lived experience, right? And so we have them perhaps do a day of service with a local organization, perhaps they will um, uh, do a, um, conduct a fundraiser. Last year we had our Ghana group when they came back from Ghana, they hosted a fundraiser in collaboration with the Black Student Union and raised $800 in order to implement a program that they uh, help design while they were in Ghana with an organization there that was looking to um, create a program for young women and girls for professional development and uh, those seeking higher education. So again, we understand that on the ground, they might not be able to do the most in a short amount of time, but the uh, principle is that they are learning so that they continue to act on that learning. 
Then we have education, orientation, and training. Those are our three learning components. What's the difference between the three? Education is issue-based education, right? So this is providing a framework of intersecting perspectives to help participant understand the root causes and effects of social issues. So, you know, this is really the meat of the issue, the community, what's going on. Orientation. That is orienting the students to their community, the organization, the project, really getting them familiar with all the actors on the ground, maybe considerations like language, currency, other greater issues that are happening in the country that they should be aware about um, you know, before they step in. And, and I keep saying country, but really the community, right? It could be also domestic. Uh, training, so these are the skill sets, right? Um, so for example, um, one of our groups, now they ended up not doing this project because the community organization basically said, we don't actually want you to do this service. However, what they were looking to do was um, they were going to Puerto Rico um, and their program was looking at building solidarity with the local communities. Um, they had wanted to help with rebuilding, right, construction. I told him, if you're gonna do any construction work, you must get training on skills. I don't want people going to Puerto Rico and holding a hammer for the first time in their lives, right? If we're going to do that kind of work, we must make sure that our participants and our leaders have the skill set, the training necessary in order to engage in that work. So that could be soft skills as well, right? I mentioned hard skills here, but it can also be soft skills. Um, you know, again, engaging with some vulnerable communities means that we need to make sure that we're cultivating those skill sets, those um, empathy skill sets, uh, in cultural competencies, and so forth, in order to engage effectively with those communities. Then we have reflection, right? This is the synthesis, the meaning making. And this happens continuously throughout our programming, pre-departure, during the programming, you know, on the ground, whether that's informally in a van um, or formally at the end of the evening. Reflection is a big part of our program. Identity consciousness. So this is a new um, principle that has been introduced. So it's this idea of making sure that we are always thinking about our participants and their lived experience and how they're interpreting their experience, how they identify the role of power and privilege in perpetuating injustice and in their own lives and identities. Um, and so we're always making sure that we're keeping the identity of our participants and our community partners at the center of our scaffolding as we build out these programs. Just a few more, equity, um, redistribution, right? We're about building reciprocity, mutual benefit. Um, we see engagement and service as a tool of liberation. So we are looking to not only explore root causes of injustice, but also actively through our engagement, be intentional, intentional about how we are distributing or spending our resources, how we're exercising power, how we are um, perhaps fitting into or even perpetuating power imbalances in a community, and also questions around wealth, right? Um, so we always say that service and engagement should be sustainable, should be thought about in the long-term rather than the immediate. We know the limitations of our program, that it's a short-term program. They're typically one, two weeks long, maybe sometimes three weeks long, um, but we know the limitations of our program. Full immersion. So being present, right? Being 100% present, this includes a alcohol and drug-free environment. We do get pushback on this from students and staff and faculty alike, because many of the places we go to, the drinking age is um, you know, 18. Sometimes the hosts want to welcome you with an alcoholic beverage, um, but we really want to be there fully present for our partners so that we can set out and accomplish what we're there to, to be. Uh, it sounds like you might not be seeing my screen. 
Are you all seeing the components screen? Just making sure. No, okay. Sorry, you all. I just realized you're not seeing the screen that I'm showing. Let's try this again. Sure. Apologies, you all. All right. Hopefully now you can see it. I think I'm just gonna stay away from the presenter view. I think it's it's confusing it. So um we've talked about strong engagement, education, orientation, training, reflection, identity, consciousness, equity, full immersion, and last but certainly not least, reorientation. Reorientation, what does that mean? It's the idea of rebuilding your community once you've returned to remobilize, to synthesize everything that you learn, to remobilize, think about how are you gonna continue your action and activism to, to either and or, to and or support your partners in your host or destination community, right? Your host community and or your community here right? Whether that's DC, perhaps some of the students might want to impact their communities from their hometowns, right? But again, making sure that they're applying that to their lived experience. This isn't a one-off experience that we're exoticizing, saying this is a problem that happens over there, and this is not a problem that happens here, but really making sure that students understand that connection. Some of the frameworks we use to inform that work, we have a um, community collaborator continuum. So you can see that here on the left, and I'm not gonna go too much into depth here, but this really is looking at how do we measure the impact of these programs, right? And we ask students to think about where are they starting, right? Do they consider themselves perhaps a member of a community? They're maybe not so aware of their role in social issues, they're not aware of, their role of how their identity might play into their power and privilege and how they operate in the world. Perhaps they're a volunteer, right? Well-intentioned, but perhaps not well-educated. Perhaps they consider themselves a conscientious engager, concerned with discovering root causes, asking the bigger, um, connecting the bigger picture to a singular issue. And the goal here, of course, is the community collaborator, somebody who makes community a priority in their values and actions, allows the community to lead the change, right? They're not appropriating any cause, um, understanding the root causes and sees the interconnectedness between issues, right? And so this is sort of the spectrum that we move or hope to move students along. We tell students like all things that progress is not linear, right? Sometimes, um, you will struggle and you will get stuck in a certain stage. In fact, we tell them, you know, most people get stuck in that third stage, conscientious engager. And we, we try to give them strategies to move beyond that. And we also try to help them think laterally about ways that they can create social change, right? Not just direct service, not necessarily, they don't have to go and fill a grocery bag, right? They could do advocacy work if they're a writer, if they're creative, right? We try to get them to think about what skills, passions, interests, talents, right? What makes them shine? How can they leverage that and frame it to impact change, right? And so taking their natural abilities and leveraging that to create change. So um, this is a social uh, social wheel of change. Um, this comes from actually Transform Mid-Atlantic. They are an association of Mid-Atlantic universities and colleges that are engaged in community-based learning. So if any of these resources, by the way, if any of these resources interest you, um, as I mentioned, I'm from the Center for Community Engagement and Service. So we have lots of wonderful resources to help you navigate this field. So these are just some snapshots of what students have come up with in the past. And this actually came from the reorientation phase, right? So this came from once students came back, they were thinking about 
how can they engage in philanthropy, right? How can they raise money, raise awareness, advocacy, um, you know, cap not capitalize, but rather leverage the expertise of local members and leaders of the community to continue um, bringing awareness to the issue on campus. Also service, right? Doing that direct service, going and, and kind of getting your hands metaphorically dirty, so to speak, right? And, and actually engaging in that hands-on volunteering. So who is involved in alternative breaks? There are lots of different actors. So just to give you kind of a little bit of a breakdown of who some of the stakeholders are. Um, so first we have the staff, right? That's myself, the assistant director. I also oversee next year, I will oversee two program assistants and they will really help ensure that we take care of all the logistics, right? We take care of logistics, we help scaffold the education portions, um, make sure that everything is falling under university policies, procedures, think, um, working with stakeholders like risk management, for example, as you can imagine with travel, you know, we do have to make sure that we are safe. Um, so alternative break staff. Then we have the leadership council. So if you know any outstanding students that you think would be great at designing and implementing an alternative break program, please, please, please let them know that the leadership council applications are open right now. Um, we're very excited. This is the first year that we are uh, introducing the council. And essentially what our vision is to have this body be the principal decision-making body and executor of program design, development, and management of all stages. So again, these are comprised primarily of students. There are a couple of opportunities as faculty or staff to be a, um, a chair member of the council. They are accepted on an application basis. As I mentioned, the applications are currently open. And how this works is essentially students apply for the role, right? Uh, in the past, leaders were proposing a program. They were saying, this is where I wanna go. This is what I wanna do. The challenge we had was we were going to different communities, working with different partners, studying different issues, every single group, not super sustainable. So what we've decided is we're going to ask program leaders to, first of all, think about why they're doing this. If they're doing this because they want to develop their leadership skills, develop skills in intercultural competency, then what we ask them to do is to apply for the role, right? They're applying for the position to be on the council. Then on the council, they will hold a particular um, chair right? So they might be the recruitment chair, they might be the reorientation um, chair, ethical engagement chair, education chair. So we have a number of chairs. Um, but in addition to being the chair member who's really going to take the lead on those different areas of program logistics, they will also serve as a site coordinator, which then empowers them to be the program leader. So each member will say, they'll come together as a council. They're going to discuss, these are some of the programs, some of the issues, some of the locations that we want to explore. And then through compromise, discussion, discourse, maybe input from some of our uh, faculty and staff um, chairs, you know, we'll come up with a program offerings. For all of you here, you know, you as staff and faculty have kind of, I don't wanna say extra power, but you do have sort of, um, we're, we're very much encouraging and welcoming ideas from you all. So if you have ideas, you know, please let us know. Um, but as a group, as a collective, we will determine what the program offerings will be. And then each member of the leadership council will be paired with a co-leader to be their program leader, right? They'll be the program leader for that program and actually take the program uh, on the trip. So that's the leadership council. Again, if you have any questions, it's new. It can be a little bit confusing. I know I've had a lot of students asking questions. So by all means, feel free to drop your questions in the chat. Um, participants, right? These are participants and they can expect 
to um, for the program to be quite competitive. I would say last year, you know, after the pandemic, I would say post pandemic is still really amongst us, but, you know, post pandemic, quote unquote, uh, it was quite a competitive program. Students and staff and faculty alike were very excited to travel. Um, and because of that, uh, we had probably an acceptance rate of less than 50%. So I did tell students, you know, make sure you're putting effort. We really want to make sure that participants, we don't expect them to be experts, right? We don't expect leaders to be experts in the issue areas. So we definitely don't expect participants. Um, but we want to make sure that the participants are committed because they are required to attend at least five to eight pre-departure meetings before the meeting or before the um, immersion, right, before the trip. For faculty and staff members, if you are a program advisor, you don't have to go to every single one, right? We definitely don't expect you to attend every single one, but for participants, uh, we do make it an expectation, a requirement that you attend. And so for that, again, you know, we have a very intentional curriculum, right? We're not just a travel program. We are truly an immersive curriculum. And then we have the support, right? This is you all. So what we're gonna talk about today are the roles that you can help to support our program, whether you wanna be a campus liaison chair, a subject mentor, and or a program advisor. Um, and essentially what your role is to really help ensure that our programs are accessible to the campus community, really responding to what you are all hearing and seeing as what's important and relevant in our campus community, making sure that we're meeting our learning and engagement objectives. Um, we even have a dedicated chair for impact and, and evaluation, just because we want to make sure that we are looking at, at our um, impact and promoting ethical community partnership building. So I recognize that we have a beautiful tapestry of diversity at our campus, all sorts of individuals who have different lived experiences, different skill sets, different passions and interests. And so we hope that you are able to bring that to the table. Um, and so again, even if you are, let's say you're going to a program to, um, let's say Ghana, Right? And you've never been to Ghana, you don't know anything about Ghana, but what you're really passionate about is student development, about ethical community-based community building, that makes you just as um, eligible, right? So just want to say, you know, that we're looking for all sorts of different support. All right, so how can you get involved? Just doing a quick time check here. So campus liaison chair, what is a uh, campus liaison chair, subject mentor, program advisor. Again, you can fulfill one of these roles or a combination of the three. And here we have some photos. We'll have some nice little photos popping up here. This is our group um, from Austin. I'm sure Rhonda will tell you a little bit more about them, but this was a um, flow code party where they assembled uh, some menstrual products and distributed them to students, or not students, to community, the community in Austin. So great photo. Campus liaison chair. What's involved? So these are two to three faculty or staff members who have a strong investment in our program and can offer valuable insight from their experience with alternative breaks. So again, we're, we're hoping our preference is for somebody who has experience with alternative breaks. It's not necessary, you know, I, I wouldn't say that that's a deal breaker, but we are looking for somebody who can bring that, that insight and experience. Um, what's involved, we would like you to attend the majority of the biweekly leadership council meetings. We understand that you have your own work, um, your own lives, and so, you know, I'm not going to say it's mandatory, but we just hope you can attend as many as you can in order to effectively contribute to the overall strategy and vision of the program. Uh, we heavily encourage you to attend the leadership orientation. I'm hoping, I will say these are to be confirmed, but right now we have planned Wednesday, September 3rd from 6 to 9 p.m. Again, you don't have to be there the whole time, um, or you can attend virtually. We'll also have 
an all day retreat from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Saturday, September 9th. This is going to be that really intense session because we are a little bit behind schedule. This is going to be a really intense session as far as like looking at the programs, what we want to do, where we want to go. Um, and so if you want to be a part of that, that would be the session to attend. What we're also looking for from this chair is somebody who's willing to advocate, help us recruit others, right? Help us leverage your networks and find other subject mentors, especially as you know, kind of the program issues and the communities, being able to identify, oh, I know somebody at this department or I know somebody over here that would be a great subject mentor or a great program advisor. Um, sometimes it's just easier to get buy-in from other faculty and staff when they're hearing it from their colleagues, right? It's sometimes hard for the students to ask their, their faculty and staff members. And just leverage your own network to build strategic partnership and, and support our growth, right? We're in a really exciting time um, that we're rebuilding, we're revitalizing, and so New ideas are absolutely welcome. I have a very transparent and open forum with my students where I'm always welcoming their feedback. So that is always welcome and encouraged. Eligibility, um, pretty much anyone, uh, part-time, full-time, anybody can be a campus liaison chair. Uh, compensation for this work, um, it is considered service to the university. There are opportunities to attend professional development, op uh, I don't know why I put opportunities, conferences um, twice. Um, so, you know, we have the Breakaway Conference. There's other conferences that I like to identify and take the student leaders to. So as somebody who's, you know, um, as somebody who's connected to our program, I will definitely invite you to those development opportunities as well. Um, you're also welcome to serve as a subject mentor, and you will be on the priority consideration for program advisor role, and that's the travel part, right? That's kind of the, the glitz and the glam of the program. Subject mentor. So the subject mentor is our expert. This is somebody who's just consulted on a periodic basis. There's really not a whole lot of commitment here, but we'll just kind of be reaching out to you saying, you know, can you give us some guidance on maybe a partner who's located in this area, or maybe can you give us guidance on some of the social issues, um, maybe issues around LGBTQ community uh, in that location, you know, different types of issues that might be really relevant um, to our program. Um, and again, they don't have to just be a community expert, but also can be somebody who has a lot of experience doing community-based learning or research, right? And is, is very familiar with the pedagogy. And they really help us provide support in areas of community partner development, cultural trainings, and other preparation components. No regular commitment, just periodic cons consultation here. Eligibility, again, anybody, um, adjunct as well. Um, so anybody is eligible for this, staff, faculty, part-time, full-time, exempt, non-exempt, compensation, service to the university, again, same, same things, opportunities to attend conferences, um, serve as campus liaison chair, and priority consideration for program advisor. And program advisor, so this is the most um, intensive of the commitments. It requires the most from staff and faculty members, um, but it also kind of is, has the most, I don't want to say the most rewarding, but you know, you really get to be with the students on the ground and watch everything come alive. Um, so what does this involve? So this is a staff or faculty member who accompanies the group on the program experience. So in a domestic program, we are required to have from risk management, uh, one leader. Internationally, we must have two. Um, they're recruited during the participant application cycle by the leadership council. So right now, um, for all of you being here at the end, I have a little spreadsheet I'll ask you to sign up if you're interested in any one of these roles. And we'll make sure that the leadership council reaches out to you as we start to build our programs um, so that we make sure that you stay connected. 
What is also expected is attendance of selected pre-departure meetings with the leaders um, and the participants. We wanna make sure you know who you're going with, um, that you're able to guide the leaders in facilitating a thoughtful, inclusive and safe experience. Um, and I just realized now I left off a bullet about also mandatory meetings with our office. I think it does have it on the next slide. Um, but there are some trainings that you'll need in order to, to make sure that you can safely execute the program. Um, while it is a bonus, if you're an issuer community expert, it is not required. There may be some cases where language skills are required um, just for safety reasons. Um, so that might be a requirement. You know, it, it ultimately kind of also comes up to the program leaders, whether or not they feel that they want somebody who's more an expert in that subject area, especially if it's a very, um, if it's a very sensitive topic, right? And it takes a lot of finesse to maybe navigate those conversations. Um, you know, that might be a, a preference, but it won't be necessarily a requirement. So expectation, participation, right? Participation in pre-departure, on the ground, and post-departure learning, engagement, reflection, and meetings activities. Adhering to the principles designed by the group leaders. Creating a positive learning environment. You know, fostering and promoting an inclusive and respectful learning environment. Um, Support facilitation, right? We never ask you to lead anything. Just to clarify, the student leaders, the program leaders truly are the leaders. You are just there for support, for coaching, for feedback. Um, so you are not expected to uh, lead the facilitation, um, but rather just support the students and ensuring that they're doing a good job at it. Communicating with our office, especially as issues arise, there are trip evaluations and some paperwork involved, not, nothing too extensive. Um, the primary form of paperwork that you're responsible for is the financial reserves. So if you're on an international trip, one of the program advisors will be the designated petty cash carrier. Um, and so I'll work with you to, to make sure you get the petty cash, that that's all accounted for appropriately and that that gets reconciled within 21 days of travel. Um, another important expectation to mention here is that we do require you to secure release from your immediate supervisor because the role requires so much time, especially when you're on the ground. Oftentimes our days are very intense. You know, you can expect an 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. day, um, so a 12 hour day. And because of that, um, you know, we want to make sure that this is not counted towards your work hours nor your vacation time. So I'm actually going to skip to the eligibility um, and I'll kind of back up a little bit more. Um, but for eligibility, we do ask that only exempt full time faculty or staff um, fulfill this role. Um, as I mentioned, because of the hours required. Um, as compensation, however, for all of your time, for all of your work, you'll receive all program-related costs covered. So that's travel, food, accommodations, activities, visa, immunizations, things like that. Um, and I'll work with you if you have any other accommodations that like, you know, personal accommodations that you need. Um, it is also considered service to the university, and once again, you'll have the opportunity to attend professional development opportunities. So those are some of the benefits of the program, but I also want to make very clear that it is intensive and that you're spending a lot of time with students, especially when you're traveling with them on the ground. Um, as I mentioned before, our program is about uh, pushing students outside of their comfort zone. So students are not staying in four-star hotels. Um, sometimes they might be staying in an Airbnb, but typically we're asking for groups to stay in places like um, hostels, even churches. Oftentimes churches have quarters that we can sleep in. Um, some groups have stayed in dorm rooms at other universities. 
Um, and so the accommodations can be quite humble, right? And so I just wanna make sure that we're all aware that if you are deciding to travel with the group that it's not going to be, you know, the Ritz. Pre-trip responsibilities. Um, so meeting with your student leaders, attending the program advisor orientation, meeting with our office to get training on group dynamics and interpersonal conflict, navigating those issues, the petty cash advance use and reconciliation policies, and risk management policies and procedures. And those are three the three um, sort of mandatory meetings, trainings that we ask you to attend. And then we ask you to attend at least two to three pre-departure trainings if you can. I will say sometimes these meetings are on the weekends or at nighttime. We always ask our leaders to try to be very accommodating to allow you to attend virtually as well. Um, but we're hoping you know, that they host about four to seven meetings, maybe five to eight. We'll see how the year pans out, um, but a number of meetings and we hope that you can join for a couple of those at least to get to know the group. On the ground. So if you are on a domestic trip, you might be driving. Actually, let me go up to the, the first bullet here. Um, participation, right? We want you to be just as much of a participant and as a learner as everybody else, right? And it's okay to kind of take that um, sort of side panel position where, you know, you really are just allowing for the leaders to work it all out and you're there for guidance, but you are participating and we want you to learn. We want you to enjoy um, the experience. Driving, if you're domestic, you know, only for domestic uh, programs with driving come up. If you're comfortable, um, keep in mind, you would be driving a larger van. Um, risk management does not allow for you to drive a van above 13 passengers, but there could be driving involved. Mentorship, conflict management, uh, ensure health safety of the group, budget or money management, community partner relations, report major incidents, um, all, uh, American University alternative break policy management, like no alcohol or enforcing issues around public transportation. There are some communities and some locations where public transportation is absolutely not a problem to take. And there are some locations that we ask you, please do not take public transportation, do not use uh, ride sharing services and so forth. Um, reflection, co-facilitation and support, again, not leading and emergency response. Once you come back from your program, we do have a program evaluation we ask you to fill out. Um, we'll ask you to meet with us, you know, engage in a debrief. Um, and then also with the petty cash, make sure that that budget is balanced within 21 days of return. And we also host a community collaborator conference. It's, it's sort of a showcase event where students get to talk about their experiences. They can continue to advocate for their communities if they wanna host a fundraiser at the event, they wanna make it a cultural event. Um, it really, again, the students are the ones to design and develop, but we have a great conference that we'd love for you to, to attend. Um, so collaborating with a program or with our office, we are absolutely open to it. If you have an idea, please email me at the end of this uh, presentation. I'll have my email address. Um, but just so you're all aware, you know, we will want to talk about what will be our various roles in terms of expectations around program costs exclusivity of program participation? Do you want it to just be restricted to your students or would you like it to be open to you know, the whole campus? How involved do you wanna be, especially if you're a faculty member, how involved do you wanna be in scaffolding and facilitating the learning curriculum? How involved do you wanna be in the partnership development? Um, but all I ask is that you keep in mind that we are not a travel agent. Um, so we don't necessarily organize trips if you say, I want to go here. Like, we won't just organize all the logistics without the pedagogy, right? Without the philosophy and the values that 
we espouse, we wanna make sure that if our name is on it, it is truly an alternative break program. So what to expect as a program advisor? Um, so today we have Professor Rhonda Zimlidge here from the Department of Literature. Uh, she um, accompanied the group to Austin, Texas in spring 2023 to explore sexual and reproductive health rights and justice. So um, we have, oops, a couple of lovely photos here of the group uh, just arriving to Austin, Texas. I know she enjoyed these photos. So really phenomenal group. Uh, Rhonda did such an incredible job at supporting our student leaders and our students, and they had such great things to say about her. So um, why don't I go ahead and let her take it away from here? Let me stop sharing here. Great. Thanks so much, Ariana. Can y'all hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and also, I want to just thank the Center for Community Engagement and Service and the All Break Program for not only today, but for the entire experience that I've had over the last year. It's been pretty incredible. So as Ariana mentioned, I was um, the faculty advisor on the Sexual and Reproductive Health Rights and Justice Program that went to Austin, Texas. And we went over spring break and we had an amazing time, learned so much. And I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about that. Um, what I did was uh, I was approached by a couple of former students of mine, and they asked if I'd be interested in acting in this role for this program they were putting together. And I was very enthusiastic about what they were doing. So, of course, I said yes. Um, you know, something uh, sparked that interest in me. And I come from a long tradition of interest-based learning and student-driven learning. And that was one of the things that attracted me to the program, seeing the hard work that these two students had already put together to make this program um, come off the ground just really inspired me. But of course, you know, female-bodied uh, reproductive rights is something that is also really important to me. So um, I said, let's do it. And uh, initially, we weren't sure if we would need to have a second faculty member, so we had a lot of fun sort of getting with other faculty on campus and uh, having conversations, um, the, the two student facilitators and myself, and that was really terrific. Once they went through the process of getting the participants interviewed and then selected, and they had formed the team, uh, the students then decided on a day of the week where they would meet regularly and they picked a Sunday afternoon, well, actually sort of evening because it was a little bit later in the day around four or five. And I was able to attend many of those meetings and I really enjoyed attending because I liked the topics they were discussing. I felt like it brought me up to speed on, you know, post Dobbs decision, um, period poverty, not only in Texas where we were headed, but also on our own campus at AU um, and, you know, some of the other um, topics that the students uh, discussed through those meetings. I really enjoyed that time. And it gave me an opportunity to get to know each of the participants before we went to our destination. So, a couple of the things that I found really successful, like I've already said, that student-driven component of the program was terrific. Um, you know, it wasn't that I just sat back and watched everything unfold around me, but, you know, I would say the majority of the program went without a hitch and the students, you know, orchestrated much of the um, everything that needed to be taken care of. They pretty much ran the program. Um, I also was an active participant in the program. So when we had Q&A in our um, pre-departure meetings, I participated in those meetings, uh, meeting with our um, partners on the ground once we were in Austin. You know, I had a really amazing experience interacting with each of our partners. And so it was very enriching for me personally. Um, also just participating with the students and finding out why each of them selected this program and invested their time and energy in the program. Very rewarding. Um, I think another thing that I found really successful was maybe this falls in tips and tricks, but the Alt Break program provided a spreadsheet 
that um, I think it was a Google sheet so that they could see the expenses as they occurred and I could input expenses as they occurred and just help to keep everything straight and organized. I did have a you know, chunk of money that I put in my account and I did everything via debit cards. So tracking that money, then giving back the balance to the program along with all the receipts. I thought I found that really streamlined and it, I think it went really smooth. Um, and I'm speaking from experience because I used to work for and volunteer with a program called Mobility International USA, and they're a student exchange program with lots of travel internationally, and I did their books, and I'm telling you, I think Alt Break has a really good thing they've got going there, so um, it was pretty streamlined. Uh, one of the tips and tricks that I found really helpful was it was suggested I take pictures of receipts just in case a paper copy gets lost along the way. And so I did take a photo every single time. But again, the money really was no problem. Um, challenges that came up, we only had, I would say, one minor challenge. And that was um, the students had opted to not rent the van. Uh, so I was planning on driving the big van, but then they sort of changed the program as uh, we started to learn more about where we were going to be staying and what was going to be happening. And we decided we would rely on public transportation. So as Ariana mentioned, again, this program, it was appropriate to use public transportation in Austin. Really easy. We had a bus stop close by. We stayed in dorms um, on the campus there at uh, UT Austin. And we did take Lyft to and from the airport, and we used Lyft on a few other times too, but that was, uh, that was set up in a pretty easy way as well. The only speed bump that we hit with that, um, maybe pun intended there, is the uh, Lyft that we had been given uh, Lyft passes and they weren't um, available on the weekend and nobody could foresee that until we tried to use it when we arrived and we're like, oh, we're here on a weekend and this isn't working. But again, that was minor because we did, I did have other ways of paying for things. Um, and then the other thing I would just say is that, you know, uh, we were dealing with some pretty um, touchy subjects and, um, not everybody, you know, had, had the same opinions or experiences, but everybody was very respectful of each other's opinions and experiences within our program. Now, out in the world, especially being in a place like Texas, you know, uh, the our program didn't necessarily align with some of the values that we encountered in the community. However, everything that the students um, talked about and discussed and learned about leading up to the program really helped to make um, smooth interactions with the folks that we met. I mean, we met some people who were anti-abortion. We met some people who were anti-gay and uh, trans participation in sports, and that was at the state capitol. And the conversations that I um, witnessed between our students and some of these participants was true discourse, you know, just a questions and answers sort of exchange. And I, I found that really, really valuable. Um, I'll also say I was very comfortable, you know, the dorms were Spartan, but they were fine. Uh, I had my own room, which I thought was a nice touch. I was also willing to share, but we had, it was such a, um, perfect agreement and arrangement that I didn't really have to share with any of the students, but I, I think I would have with one of the student leaders, uh, you know, it was two pretty big beds in a, in a large, maybe an RA style dorm room, but, um, you know, I, I'm just still thrilled with the experience that I had. I still continue to keep in contact with the participants for my program. I wrote a couple of letters of recommendation this summer for them, and uh, most all of them follow me on LinkedIn and Instagram, <laughs> and I've followed back. So, you know, I've, I've really formed a true um, partnership with the students that participate in the program, and I'm very grateful for, for that. Uh, it was a terrific outcome. Thanks. Thank you so much, Rhonda. And yeah, I just heard from one of our leaders actually that 
she and one of the participants are starting a chapter of No More AU, which is um, an international organization that works to end domestic and sexual violence through sustainable cultural change. So again, love to see that our students are really living our philosophy of continuing that engagement post the program, right? It's not just one and done. Um, Sulakshi, our student leader, was always phenomenal in this area. She's even met with Kamala Harris in this issue area um, to celebrate her work. But um, thank you again for, for everything. So um, why don't I just actually go ahead and open it up? Well, first of all, let me talk quickly, very quickly now, because I know we only have a few minutes left, um, but I want to leave a few moments for, for questions. Um, other tips and tricks, though, that I might share, step back, right? Let leaders work it out. Let them lead the group. Let them be in charge. Um, create relationships before departure. I think Rhonda did a phenomenal job at really getting to know her leaders and the participants. So they felt very comfortable with her. As she mentioned, the subject matter was sensitive. So having that trust and that relationship is really important. Um, knowing your own travel comfort levels, right? Especially traveling with students. We can't always guarantee a private room. Um, we will do our best. Um, but if you have any accommodations, any concerns that you have, please feel free to um, let us know at any point throughout the program. That sounds supposed to say PO, so to say throughout the program. Um, so some goals we have. So the Leadership Council currently being assembled, applications are open. Um, I can, I'm also happy to send the links for the application for the Leadership Council if you wanna share that with students. Um, during the orientation and leadership retreat, the council will deliberate over the programming for the year um, in consultation with risk management and our subject mentors, um, as well as the campus uh, liaison chair. And we're really looking to provide the following portfolio per programming. So legacy programming, looking at some of the past programs we've done. If you go onto the Alternative Break website, there is a page that says past program archive, you will see hundreds of programs and we have so many to choose from. So we're looking to return to some of those communities and some of those programs. Um, we wanna make sure that the topic is that is selected is in alignment with institutional priorities and values that we have campus support, right? That's all of you. The more support we have from other faculty members, staff members, centers, other departments, the better. The more successful and buy-in, uh, the more successful it will be, right? For the buy-in that we have, um, the program location. We are looking to focus on domestic as much as possible, um, and or cost, right? And I, I recognize that domestic does not necessarily mean cheaper, um, but what we're really looking at is making sure that we have affordable, accessible programming. Um, hoping to have about 60% legacy, 50% domestic, and maybe 50% of programming with a participant fee under a thousand. This is all just my pipe dream, what I hope can happen. Um, so we'll see how it goes. For context, last year, we had participants that were 75% identified as students of color, 25% first generation and 70% high financial need. This year, we are facing some limitations around funding. And so that's why I'm being very transparent as far as like, we just don't have as much money as we did last year because of the years of the program not running for a while. Um, and so we just wanna make sure that these programs are affordable to start with because we can't give out these um, large grants like we did last year. Last year, we were quite generous. Um, so we just wanna make sure it's accessible. All right, so with the last four minutes I have with you all, um, does anybody have any questions that they'd like to drop in the chat? Um, I have, let me just drop in the chat here. Uh, I have a spreadsheet here that if you are interested in staying involved, and I will of course reach out to anybody who's participated in our program, sorry, not participant for uh, attended today's session. I will make sure to email you all, um, but I wanna make sure that you all get this worksheet. 
spreadsheet. So in the chat here, I've just dropped a spreadsheet. If you are truly interested in staying in touch, feel free to fill out the information, just asking for your name, title, department, which role you're interested in supporting us with, um, any programs you're interested in collaborating with us on, any other notes you wanna share with us. Um, and so forth, my... That's the spreadsheet there. And if anybody wants to get in touch, oh my gosh, I just realized that my title slide with my email is gone. So if anybody wants to get in touch with me, feel free to email me at ariana at american.edu if you have any questions at all. 